Hey, good evening and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. We are on the road to town meeting day 2020. And this is a very special election. It's a different one because we have one district that has no incumbent and it has two candidates running. Uh, basically with Ashley Hill uh, resigning, we have one person for a one year term and we have um, the other one contested for a two year term. So we have some good candidates and good races up in District 3. Uh, District 2, Connor Casey is running unopposed and in District 1, Donna Bate is running unopposed. So what we did is we paired them together and we did a one hour show which is really good. It's in two half hour blocks. And then um, we also have Ann Watson mm -hmm. talking about her candidacy. She's running unopposed as well, but she's going to explain why she should return. Uh, we have Bill Fraser talking about the city budget. We have Libby talking about the school budget. We have uh, all of the school board candidates who are running, all of which are going to sit on this school board. <laughs> and I have one tonight. I have Mara Iverson. Wow. Uh, Mara, what district do you live in? I live in District 1. In District 1. And how long have you lived in Montpelier? I've lived in Montpelier for six years. The same period of time that I've lived in Vermont. Oh my goodness, you came, and you came here from where? Texas. What part of Texas? Um, College Station. I was working at Texas A&M. A little bit of culture shift between uh, here and there. Not only culture shift, but weather shift. A little bit. <laughs> Now, you are on the school board right now, but just on the school board like this. Right, yes. <laughs> Could you talk about how you came about to take Rebecca's seat? Start by why did you file papers, that a is, paper of intent? That's a great question because, you know, like school boards are not everybody's cup of tea for how they want to contribute. I went to a school board meeting last year. Um, it, they were doing a diversity statement. They were kind of going to do like an announcement of the fact that they were going to put one in place. And um, I was, I'm in um, the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic Studies and Social Equity. And so we were going to go basically just to, you know, cheerlead like, yay, good job. Um, and as I was listening to them having conversations about other things that were going on, um, I, uh, you know, one thing that came up was something uh, around like days off from school and who is allowed to have them and for what reasons, what justifies. And there was a topic all of a sudden that came up around, um, you know, students who, who face socioeconomic challenges. And I grew up as a free lunch kid. And so I was wrapped with attention all of a sudden. And I realized as they were having these conversations, but that, that it seemed like there were a lot of folks that were just hadn't come from that background and I just thought like wow I would really like to be able to be on the board and be able to speak from a like I was a free lunch kid and I'm an LGBT person and um and you know just kind of wrap my mind around youth who maybe don't get voice or seen the same way. Now you're another minority on that board along with Tina Muncy mm -hmm. and what would that be? Well, that's, that's a good question. Now I feel like I don't know. You don't have a child in the school. Oh, that's valid. Yes, that is very much a minority. And I, so my job 24-7 is um, Outright Vermont, which is a youth advocacy organization. So in a lot of ways, I feel like my kids are Vermont's kids. So, I mean, I obviously don't have 89,000 children, but a lot of times I feel like um, the work that I do is responsible for, like, I have to care about them and think about them all the time. And so that um, was a really comfortable transition to thinking about Montpelier, that like I live in this town and these kiddos are going to contribute to the world that I live in. And so it might be a cool way to channel my energy and my interests to help out with the school board. Even though you don't have a child in the school. Even though I don't have a child in the school. Is that a different perspective on the board? Do you feel like that it, not having a horse in the, in, in the race, or do you feel that that's different for you, that you can step back and, and look at it differently than people who have children in school? I think so, and I think it's really, the, like, you would absolutely have to have a mix of all different sorts of things. Like, I think it would be brilliant to have folks who have had children but don't currently, or who have 
maybe a brand new one and they are going to be, and maybe people who have none at all like me or kid, people who have kiddos in the schools right now, because they're all coming at the question of like what is public education and what is public education for our youth here in Montpelier with different perspectives. And so mine is very much a civic perspective. I'm coming at it from a like, these are our responsibility, we're the grown-ups, and what we decide what is important enough to teach the youth and we decide what is important to some degree to we have a curriculum that the state has right, established right, that we're working right. with and we and don't have that right much well we being the grown-ups okay the grown-ups collectively and so my little piece of the grown-up puzzle is in this particular school district um, there's a place for the board to sometimes be a sounding board for things that are going on or just like a gut check for, for or folks for specific yes, concerns. right. Well, and the, the, the actual board doesn't have a lot of official, like, I mean, pass the budget and, like, supervise the superintendent. Like, well, you also not a lot of... You're also setting policy. Yes, that's true. Which that's is true. important. And I'm really excited about that. That's one of the reasons that I decided that it would be worthwhile, at least to try for a period of time, um, because policy is... It's just the structure that we use to, to like exist on a daily basis. And if you are a kid who is left out of that policy or who a policy negatively affects, that means every moment that you're at school, that's the fishbowl that you are swimming in and you can't escape it. So really good policy is what holds the kids and makes them be okay in school. And bad policy can make kids uncomfortable and even unsafe at school. Getting on that school board where everybody else has been working, meshing, peddling together for a while, and you're dropped into the budget process, nonetheless, mm. the most complicated yes. part of the year. That was a lot. It was, it, was, it was spectacular to hear the level of conversation. I um, had not thought a whole lot about um, school budget in the past because I mostly just thought, like, whatever they want you can't take enough of my money for education. Whatever you think you need, take it. Um, but as I was hearing the, the rationale and as I was hearing the meticulous attention to, well, what are taxpayer interests? And then what is in the best interest of the youth? And then what's in the long-term sustainability of the school? I was like, wow, these people are taking such good care of this school district. They really, really want everybody to win to the extent that, you know, a budget ever really can... I think everyone's always got something they wanted or didn't get something they wanted well, with don't a budget. Forget, but as you were to learn in a budgeting process, most of the budget is fixed and established. Mm, You're yeah, only yeah. working on the margins. Yeah, little bits at the side. And then there's a great deal like your health care that you can't even control. Right. But what we can control pretty much is frozen in city, uh, as Libby and Bill you know, said on their shows, they're nibbling on the margins, and those margins are established by policy from the board. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting. It means that um, things that are on, the, a lot of times what's on the margins is stuff that, like, it's on the margins because it's not part of the big core things. And often the youth that I'm interested in working with and the issues that I'm interested in and the kind of education that I'm interested in are the things that end up out on those margins. So I'm always wondering about... What is about, the kind of education that you're interested in that would be on those margins? That's such a good question. I, I love innovative education and new trying out new ideas. And that's inherently on the margin because it shifts and it changes and what the new idea at any given time, what it's going to be. Can, can be different over time. And there are also kind of like art, art programs, music programs, things like that that are often just at the edge of being, can, well, can we fund them as much as we want? Can we fund them at least part? Can we maybe not fund them at all right now in order to make everything fit? Um, and we don't uh, have those same conversations around like, you know, sports or whatever. Um, well, I mean, to the extent we do also have conversations about like what can we and can't we do in any given kind of extracurricular area, but those are often the areas that like keep kids in school. They are often the things that make kids want to keep trying, and that's critical to a public school. You touched on two issues in passing. 
that have really become hot button issues in a sense in our district. One is closing the achievement gap between kids who are on subsidized lunches mm -hmm. and food stamps and the rest. Mm -hmm. And that is not an issue that's a 2019 issue, a 2020 issue. That's an issue most likely were you in this town uh, when you were growing up, that would have been an issue for you. Right, right. I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, but it was the issue for my family. Yeah. What can we do? You, you experienced it directly. You have family situations where there's stress. Mm -hmm. I mean, not having enough to really make it is a stressful situation. It is. And, well, and it's, it's, it's not just stressful like some of the time. I think sometimes folks who aren't used to having kind of marginalized identities aren't what aware of... What is a marginalized of, identity? So marginalized identities usually mean like the folks who don't have power if we're looking at a particular group. So if we're looking at skin color, it's folks who are not white. Those are people who have marginalized identities. Of which there's identities. very few up here. Very <laughs> few. And so those people are experiencing tremendous stress and LGBT people as opposed to their straight okay. and cisgender peers. Just, just one more time, yeah. we're, we're gonna try it. Would you define, the, what, what does the acronym stand for? LGBT. Yeah, um, and then throw a Q on there. That's such a good one. Um, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and then you can add like a plus sign for the expanding realm of identities. Is queer a pejorative? If I were to sit and hear one kid call another queer, is that a pejorative or is that? This is a gray issue. Um, one of the fascinating things about my job is that I get to actually talk to youth. And what I have heard from the current youth is that a lot of them are happy to use the word queer for themselves as their label if it makes sense for them, but they would not feel comfortable calling someone else queer or calling the community queer unless a person specifically instructed them that that was their label. So they're owning the pejorative in a sense. They've taken a pejorative and they're owning that negativity in a positive way. Right. Well, and that's been a story for decades at this point with the word queer, kind of that reclaiming. And interestingly, the kids are actually starting to shift in a direction of reclaiming was good, but what if we still recognize that it is also pejorative and it does do harm to some people and it is still wielded like a weapon sometimes? So in those situations, it's good to be aware that we want to reclaim it and it's also been used for harm and neither of those things is going away. This is showing my age and the age of some of these people who are going to be watching this tonight. When our child, who's in his mid-20s now, was at the high school, they had the Gay Straight Club. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that a pejorative? <laughs> um, so there's lots of debate about those club names too. And so there's sort of some people have moved to Queer Straight Alliance. Um, some people have moved the, the GSA to Gender and Sexuality Alliance to be more encompassing, but they come up with all kinds of clever uh, words to try and cover the fact that we're dealing with many more identities than we were talking about, like, say, 20, 30 years ago. Now, we have non-conforming students. Mm -hmm. Non-conforming in what sense? See, we're going through the, the nomenclature tonight. Right. What is non-conforming? Um, so gender non-conforming pretty much just means that we have some expectations around gender, um, not requirements, but things that don't surprise us. So an example would be like, no one is surprised to find out that a girl has worn dresses in her life, but people might be surprised up to hear- Up here, that, up here you might not have It say depends, that. it depends. But like boys wearing dresses is still categorically less common and enough that people would notice, right? Or that people might go, oh, you're a boy who's wearing a dress. And so youth who don't conform to the sort of expectation or their behaviors are ones that would be enough for people to go, oh, that's different for someone of your gender. Um, people who do that consistently and who that's part of their identity is breaking those, um, those norms. We often use gender nonconforming for those kiddos. My wife and I were walking the dogs back home on Loomis Street. And we saw a meeting one evening that was well attended at Union Elementary School. Oh, yeah. Dealing with transgender and nonconforming students in the elementary school. Were you part of that? I was going to say, was it back in the spring? Because 
No, I think it was later. I think it was later. in school Like year. in the fall? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I have done trainings on that topic at, at UES. Okay, what would those trainings consist of? What would the parents be there for? What would they hear? Would those be parents or parents with their children? Um, I, I think... I would say parents rather than parents with their children, mostly just because it's like a two-hour training, and that is, that is not a kiddo attention span. That is a lot for small folks. Um, so usually what we do is we get the baseline stuff about understanding how gender works in our brains, how gender works amongst each other, um, how gender folds into who we're attracted to, and so we pull apart those pieces first because a lot of folks are still dealing with like a smattering of information that comes from 20 years of pull together. So that baseline first. And then from there, a, a discussion of, and we usually talk about the youth risk behavior survey data and how. What is that? So the youth risk behavior survey is this really fascinating tool that the Center for Disease Control operates. And they, it is available to all states, and states are supposed to implement it. We are actually pretty rare because all of our kids take it every two years. We only have like 89,000 people in the state who are in our school district. That's fewer than Chicago Public Schools District. So we get to do like a census of our youth, and the risk behavior part of it is what are risks that they might be experiencing, like bullying, or what are risks that they might be engaging in, like vaping? And so it gets a picture of what those risk factors are, and we get a chance to see county data breakdown. I was just about to say, in your position where you work, you would be able to see the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Community by community or county by county. Mm -hmm. How does Montpelier compare to the state of Vermont? We're pretty average. We're pretty dead center in almost everything. Um, the there's a reality that in some ways, um, the, and I would assume it's because it's a heavily involved community and a really well-funded school, that um, on average kids tend to do a little, a slightly better than the average. But we're, we tend toward on target in the middle, as much as there can really be a target with risk behaviors. It's, um, what would that risk behavior be in this case? Besides be, drug or promiscuity or things like that? Well, and promiscuity is not really, um, so you'd be thinking about things like, so bullying, um, if a student reported that they didn't feel safe at school or on the way to or from school, um, some of the risk factors are actually things that people wouldn't even think of measuring all the time. Like, do you use suntan lotion? Do you wear your seatbelt? What is your physical activity like? What is your, you know, and then there's all, you know, kind of mental health um, pieces. And then there are also belonging pieces. There's a question on the survey about, um, do you feel that you matter to people in your community? And so some of it's really concrete, like, do you smoke marijuana? And right, some right. of it is a lot more broad, like, do you feel like you're valued in community? What are parents attending that meeting who don't have children who are non-conforming or, or questioning of their stereotypical gender, you know, expectation. What are those parents there for? I think that, well, first of all, there is no reason for anyone not to know that information. It's useful information about life, right? There are people who are boys and people who are girls and people who are a blend of those or neither of those things at all or something that else that isn't even captured by those. And all of those are way that, ways that humans exist. And just because it isn't my identity doesn't mean it isn't valuable for me to know how other people exist in the world. So that's how I see it for community members who maybe don't have kids at school at all right, right. or for people who have kiddos who are, you know, straight and cisgender. Um, what is cisgender? So cisgender usually means like the label that's on your birth certificate. Like if it says F and you always felt like a girl, you're a cisgender girl. And okay. if your birth certificate says M and you always felt like a boy, cisgender okay. boy. Yeah, so straight and cisgender kiddos still need to know about all of the other ways that people exist how in the world. We, how was our curriculum at Union shaped for acceptance of, of this community? I am still not super familiar with all of the curricular pieces, but I do know that um, 
Ryan, the principal, did mm -hmm. a really, really concerted effort around trying to get people to have conversations. I was part of some of the conversations last year around like, well, what is, what's the climate at school like? What are, what's the buzz that we're hearing? What are some small actions that we could take, interventions we could use? Um, and so the curriculum kind of is gonna, the curriculum curriculum obviously comes down from the state. Right. And it doesn't have anything in it about, well, I you was know. gonna ask that whether Vermont covers that yet. <laughs> no, not really. And that's why the Act One, um, 2019 Act One that um, creates the working group to, cre um, to suggest um, social and uh, ethnic and social equity standards. Where is that right now? It was last year it was introduced. What's going on yes, with that piece so of the, it's just, I actually also sit on that um, working group. And so we have had our first couple of meetings and the next thing that happens is we submit our work plan. So that's coming up next in the next couple months here is the actual, here's what we're going to do in the steps in the timeline. And it's a long, it's a long process. It's like a three year over the course of, of time. And the obviously the hope at the end of it is that we come up with a list of here are content, not specific, you know, like you need to teach about Claudette Colvin. <laughs> so What's much that? as Cla Claudette Colvin is, um, was Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks was Rosa Parks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So not so much like individual people or right. situations, right. but competencies, er things that people should be functional to know. Just on the state level, when we're talking about Act One and the like, what happens to religious conservatives in this who feel that, that their core values are under assault? That is a really good question. And I think it's one that, um, yeah, like, as a member of the Vermont Coalition that kind of pushed for the legislation and kind of got it through and is still supporting the people who are working on the um, working group, that, that was constant part of conversation. Um, was l l being being mindful of cultures in general and religions are Culture. cultures um, and we actually were careful um, what we what we didn't want was to create a situation where people who already have a voice and who already have um, more power in a situation could use the legislation to take more power away from other people so it's um, even for people, even for people who feel a little bit like, well, schools don't have the same values that I want them to have or that they used to have. Mm -hmm. Those are often still people whose overall value set is still more common, or their overall religion is still more common than, say, our youth in schools who are Muslim. And so when you know when you're kind of looking at this group that's got very little power and is at the mer like mercy of everyone else, um, it really requires that you say, you might have to be uncomfortable with things in order for everyone to be safe. Because sometimes what happens is the, like, the big group it's, that has... It's, it's a give and take. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I sometimes talk about... Um, um, LGBT kiddos and the bathroom concept. Um, there are people who are like, well, I don't feel comfortable with my kid sharing the bathroom with those kids. And I'm like, okay, but that kid is not, your child is not unsafe in that situation. Your discomfort doesn't necessarily mean that the bathroom itself and the way that they interact with it isn't safe. But for an LGBT kids, specifically trans kids, for them to use the bathroom that isn't right for them. Trans being? Transgender being um, the label that's on your birth certificate and the gender that you feel like are not a match. My experience as a parent who had a child in the school mm -hmm. was that for decades, this school's been extremely sensitive. The kids have been extremely inclusive in terms of of acceptance of one another. It's a small community. You've seen that kid in the community. We don't have many new kids. Is bullying a, a real problem on this issue? I think my answer to that would be that bullying is still a problem, even in Montpelier School District. Um, it's not, it's absolutely not the worst school district in the state. We're kind of middling 
here on as on a lot of things. But bullying doesn't always look like we picture it in the movies, like somebody shoving your head in a toilet or pushing you into a locker. Sometimes bullying looks like someone comes up to you next to you in the cafeteria as you're trying to get your lunch and they say something like, um, nice dress bag or something like that. In our district? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, like, the stuff that happens is often, and I know that word will be jarring for some people, just, just aware that that is a hard word for some folks to hear, but that stuff does still happen in the district. Uh, does it happen more online than, in, than live? It, I, don't, I don't know that I could say it happens more online than live. What I do know is that it does happen online, and that makes it such a hard thing for parents and students and school folks alike to deal with because when it's happening online, when is it, is it, is it the schools to deal with at all? If the message has been sent during the lunch hour while they were technically on school grounds, but it was part of a conversation that started last night while everybody was at Positive Pi, where's the line? Who's responsible for what gets said and doesn't get said in those situations? And there is definitely some, um, when there's physical distance between people, and it especially if there's um, platforms where you can be anonymous, it can still oh, get that, really, really ugly. Brutal. Yeah, but it does still happen in person too. And it's not always direct name calling either. It's also sometimes just the being erased from stuff. And I wouldn't call that bullying, but I would say it contributes to a climate where people don't, where, where it doesn't feel good to be in school. So a great example is if you're a non-conforming kid and your teacher comes in in the morning and says, good morning, boys and girls, you're not in that group. You're not a boy or a girl. So do, am I included in the good morning or am I not? If we say line up boys over here and girls over here, where am I supposed to go? What so am I you're talking about teacher training on appropriate Yeah, language. all kinds of things. And that stuff is appropriate for students so that they can treat one another as peers differently. It's appropriate for teachers. It's appropriate for community and family. Everybody could use a bone up on those skills. Let's go back to the question of the achievement gap, because that's so important. Mm -hmm. What do you think we can do as a district in tangible terms to close that gap for low-income kids in the elementary school? Well, I'm personally really excited, actually, about the state-level legislation that's happening right now around the possibility of um, free lunch for universally for everyone who's attending um, Vermont schools because it is a thing to take off of the radar. One fewer thing to worry about, um, one fewer thing to, to spend your mental energy on and your resource energy on. Um, and that feels really important to me, basically just going back to my own, remembering my own childhood, um, the, you know, like the, the worry that the wrong person was going to find out that I was on free lunch and make fun of me. But still, let's, let's put that aside for a second. Yeah. You're, you're a low-income family, yeah. regardless of whether you're, you've got free lunch or not. Or yeah, let, yeah. not let's not even say that. Sure. For people who are well below average, regardless of why, mm -hmm. what can we, how can we close that achievement gap? In a, in a largely middle class and upper middle class district. Right. Well, and, and I, I hate to redirect you, but that, I don't hate to redirect you. I'm clearly going to do it anyway. The things like the universal free lunch are things that are intended. They don't seem like they're closing an achievement gap. But when we think about things like minority stress theory, which is the idea that people who are who have marginalized identities, as we talked right. about, that they are under a non-stop 24-7 mental pressure that doesn't exist for the people in the dominant categories. Do, a small thing like we're not worried about lunch anymore, lunch just happens, means we are suddenly spending our time in math potentially thinking about math instead of thinking, about the kid who's going to make fun of me for being in the free lunch line, right? So there is a direct connection to achievement when we talk about ways to make people who are having to experience stressors 
be able to let go of some of those stressors. They come off and all of a sudden the barriers to achievement are less, not non-existent, but fewer. Drugs in the high school. It's been a constant over, over decades that Montpelier wink winks about drugs in the high school. I, I feel like that is... That's a theme that I have heard actually from lots and lots of schools over lots and lots of time is that the it's school Vermont. doesn't really, well, yeah. not just Vermont, like all over the place, that schools don't really do enough to crack down on the drugs or they subtly let it go on or like everybody knows you can go to the bathroom and blah, blah, blah. Um, those, I think that youth will always find a way to be testing boundaries and to be uh, getting whatever their need met is. And for some of them, that will be using a substance. And sometimes that might be on school grounds. But my experience of uh, m like talking to Montpelier youth is that they're, the way that they talk about it and the way that they, when they're discussing what they actually see or experience, are different. So they sometimes have this perception that they're like, well, you know, people are smoking all over the place all the time. But if you break it down and really talk to them like, okay, well, where did you see it? What did you see? It turns out that they're like, well, okay, I'm, I really just saw it the once, but my friend said that they saw it. And then it, it gets to be almost a lore. So that's been my experience. It's not that there's no problems ever at school over drug use at school. It's just that the lore that the school doesn't try to make interventions or that it's subtly passed off as unimportant does seem to be mostly lore. Do you believe that our students feel safe at school? And that, that's a national question that boils itself down to a very small town in Vermont. Well, you what do you mean by our students? Uh, Union Elementary School students, do you believe that they feel that they're safe in that school? Safe from someone coming in and, and uh, doing horrible things? That's a good question. So I asked that because I was like, if you ask, um, if you ask a, a, a child of color if they feel safe at school, the answer is very likely going to be different than for a white kid. So it's really interesting to talk about, like, do our kids feel safe at school? Because different kids have different access to safety. But if we're talking about big things like... Um, like someone coming in with a gun. Right, exactly. Um, I don't know a lot about elementary school, but I do know a lot about the middle and high schoolers, and they do feel upset and unsafe. And it's not... Is there anything that we as a community can do to address that? I... This is... This is... A, a reality that I have heard from the students is their and not every student, I don't talk to every student, but many of the students that I talk to feel like if there were fewer guns in general, that would feel better. It wouldn't solve the problem, but maybe it would feel better. And I, I don't know the answer to that, but that is absolutely something that's a perception of the kiddos, is that it's just so, it, it's prevalent, it happens, and it doesn't happen here all the time, but the fact that they wonder, they just wonder, is today going to be the day that... But is that a societal American thing <clears throat> that's just working its way down to a town of 7,900? I mean, to an extent, I think, yes. To an extent, I think it's just kind of like a big thing. But every community's got slightly different... Um, you know, kind of dynamics going on. Montpelier is a small community that has a lot of internal trust, and that is tremendously valuable in terms of reducing the likelihood that there will be violent incidents. Um, but Vermont is also a place where um, gun ownership is less legislated than in other places. And so if, if kids are kind of like, how easy is it for someone to go and get access to a gun? That's going to be a different question. So there's all those different pieces kind of coming together as one culture in Montpelier. Is the culture of Montpelier High School too focused on getting into a, de a better college? We do the AP yeah. courses. We do all. Of, is there too much pressure on that at Montpelier High I, School? I don't think so. And that is mainly coming from my experience of the Flexible Pathways programs. Now, um, what is the Flexible Pathways program? So the Flexible, my perception, this is just kind of how I think about it, is we, 
we decide what school entails, right? What does it mean to be educated? Do, do you have to take Algebra 2 in order to have been, in order to have received an education? And that is a question that we ask ourselves all the time. What do, we, what do students have to do by the time that they graduate? What could they do? What constitutes learning? What's valuable? And the beautiful thing about a Flexible Pathways program is it opens the field and says there's so much that can be learning and there's so much that can be valuable. That can pick up the skills and the proficiencies right. necessary to get out of Absolutely. school. Absolutely. And so sometimes it's not the content that matters as much as that you're learning things like time management, which is going to be across the board a critical thing for the rest of your life. Okay or you're learning perseverance, or you're learning how to fail and keep, you know, like, be creative through failure. All of those things are things that you can do in flexible pathways, but you get to engage with stuff that you're picking, stuff that feels right for you. And there's room even for some experimentation, for some testing the waters and going, you know, I thought I wanted to do that. I'm glad well, I spent a semester because I don't. <laughs> but isn't Matt McLean's um, community connect, uh, of community-based learning, that sort of thing where you can just test, I'm interested in this, I go out, I shadow people. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, that is one element of the Flexible Pathways options. And there are tons more, like the Tech Center is, to, is one of the Flexible Pathways options. And they're just, even um, kind of self-directed study that where you touch base with a group or with a teacher, but you do a lot of the learning like within yourself and on your own time. Those things are also flexible pathways options. Which we start in middle school. I in, think so. I mean, middle school is a time when we're doing more and more self-study. Self mm -hmm. Mara, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, this has been an excellent session. And I, so congratulations <laughs> on being on the board. Congratulations on being reelected since no one is running against you. I, I hope that I do not lose to Mickey Mouse. No, yes. you will not lose to me. <laughs> Um, Mara, thank you, and I want to thank all of you for watching this show. I hope that you'll watch the other shows because they're really good, and it's an interesting set of candidates this year, and these are good shows. But most important, get out and vote on town meeting day. I realize that there are a ton of races that are unchallenged, but you don't have budgets that are unchallenged. And basically, the fundamental bedrock of democracy is participation by people like you and people like me, and all of our neighbors. Thank you for watching this show.